Thank you so much. Uh, when John asked me to give this talk to you, he asked me if I could give a little update from the TEDx talk I gave a couple years ago. And indeed, a lot has happened in just two years. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Everything that we do at Seattle Children's and Fred Hodge Cancer Center is based on these kids. When I go into clinic each week, I say to myself, what am I going to be doing today that I never want to be doing again? And how can my lab help fix that? In 2004, we had a 16-year-old girl who came in with a brain tumor. And you can see on the left that there's an abnormality in the MRI. And in the center, you can see what the brain looked like to the surgeon. Now, if I gave you a scalpel and asked you to cut out the tumor but leave the normal brain, where would you start and where would you stop? And in this case, the surgeon, Rich Ellenbogen, worked on this child for about 16 hours. And in the end, there was a thumb-sized piece of cancer left behind. And that day that we learned that, we decided that we were going to find a way to make the cancer light up so that surgeons could see it in the future and distinguish the brain cancer from the normal brain. Now, without going into great details, we turned to this little guy to solve the problem. This is the Israeli death stalker scorpion. And this particular scorpion makes a molecule called chlorotoxin that we learned went to brain cancer but not to normal brain. And in fact, what you see here on the left is a mouse that doesn't have a brain tumor, and on the right is a mouse that does have a brain tumor. The brain tumor is tiny, it's like the size of a pencil lead, but you can see that this molecule that we made by taking the chlorotoxin from the scorpion and linking it to a little molecular flashlight called a near-infrared fluorescent dye, we could inject it into the tail vein of the mouse, it would go through the mouse, find the cancer cells and make them light up so that we could see exactly where they were on an almost cell-by-cell -cell basis, and we imagined that this could someday be helpful for surgeons in human patients. Now, if we had d discovered this only for kids with brain tumors, it would be a real problem to find investors that would help us raise the hundreds of millions of dollars it takes to go through clinical trials to the FDA. So I went around the Fred Hutch and I borrowed mice that had colon cancer and breast cancer and sarcoma and, and prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer. And in the course of the next two weeks, we learned that tumor paint lit up all of those different kinds of cancer. And not just in mouse models of cancer, but in mice where human tumors were being grown in those mice. So this was better than we could have ever imagined. In the picture that you see with the red dots, everything that's labeled with an N is a lymph node in a mouse that had prostate cancer. And every node that lit up with tumor paint was shown to be packed with cancer cells. And the nodes that didn't light up with tumor paint didn't have cancer cells in them. And that little spot that's labeled with an L is not a lymph node, but it's a lymph channel. And it's a channel that connects one lymph node to the next. And there were about 200 cancer cells traveling from one lymph node to the other and tumor paint was sensitive enough to show light where those few cancer cells were. Uh, and this is, you know, 10,000 times more sensitive than an MRI scan. And the surgeons would be able to see it in real time. We went from mice, instead of going directly from mice to humans, where there's a 94% failure rate when drug companies do that, we decided to take a little detour through dogs. And we did this with families who brought their dogs in for cancer care. These are not research animals, these are family pets who had cancer and brought them into Washington State University Veterinary School. One of the kinds of cancers that dogs develop is sarcoma. And here you see the first dog that was injected with what is now the clinical product called Blaze 100, which is a molecule that we inject into the, into the veins that goes through the body and finds these cancers wherever they are and lights them up. And you can see in this first case that the cancer lit up, but the normal tissue did not light up. So here we're going from mouse now into dogs with their own cancer rather than a research cancer. This is a dog that has breast cancer. It's called mammary carcinoma in a dog. And the surgeons knew about that big spot down in the bottom right, that that was cancer. But really, that was all they were able to tell from the clinical exam and the scans that were done in advance. But this dog received a dose of tumor paint the day before surgery. And here is what the surgeons were able to see. Not only could they see the main tumor, but they could see additional areas of cancer that were not visible to the naked eye. And so I think that all across America, every day, women are told they had clean margins, everything looks good, we'll follow with some scans, and then six or nine months later, they get, start to get some bad news. And I think it's because the surgeons can't always see exactly where the cancer is. And sometimes the cancer isn't contiguous. There, it jumps around, and there's some spots a little ways away from the primary. And tumor paint is helping us see this, at least in the dogs. This is a human breast cancer that's growing in a mouse. And we're using a new device that we developed in collaboration with a team at Cedar sinai Hospital. And it turns out that these were surgeons developing the device. So we think that it'll be adopted by surgeons because it started with them. And they, they said, this is a device that we think that we can use. 
And the point here is that if you go back to that first slide that I showed you of the brain and where is the tissue, where is the cancer, and I gave you a scalpel in this case, would you be able to take out the tumor and leave the normal tissue behind? We think that most of you in this room actually could do that, and it shows the difference between operating with tumor paint and without tumor paint, and our hope is that someday surgeons would never be able to believe that they used to do surgery without it for cancer patients. Here's an example of a scan that none of us ever want to see when we're in clinic. This is a brainstem glioma. This is a cancer that is right between the brain and the rest of the body. And the question is, if, even if you lit this up with tumor paint, you could never do an operation here because it would disconnect the brain from the rest of the body. In the 25 years that I've been taking care of kids with brain cancer, I've never had a single child with this kind of cancer survive. And so it's really hard when I go into the rooms and I meet a child that is something like this little boy, Kyle, and I have to tell him and his parents that this is a tumor that's more than likely going to take their life within the coming year. And so we decided that we were going to go after not only this disease, but other diseases that we currently consider incurable by taking advantage of this whole new platform of drugs that we were learning about. Everything I told you about with tumor paint came from the Israeli death stalker scorpion, but it turns out that every plant and every animal needs to make drugs just to get through their everyday lives. Okay, the scorpions need it to paralyze their prey. These sunflowers need to make drugs that protect them from insects just eating them. This looks like breakfast to an insect, right? It's bright yellow, it's full of nutrition. Why wouldn't they just go through and devastate this whole field of sunflowers? But there's no pesticides on these sunflowers. These sunflowers are making their own trypsin inhibitor which blocks the enzyme that bugs would squirt on them to break them down. Well, it turns out that when I looked into this, that the trypsin inhibitor that is secreted by the sunflowers follows the same molecular rules as the molecule that was made by the scorpions. And it turns out that this is a category of drugs that are called notin peptides or mini proteins because they actually literally tie themselves in a molecular knot. And the nice thing about that is that that knot makes them resistant to stomach acid, to the enzymes in blood that would take a protein drug and make you think that it's nutrition and try to turn it into food for your body and break it down. These are really beautiful scaffolds for human drugs if you just look at them from a you know, broad perspective. These are made by diff many different kinds of plants and animals throughout the world. I'll give you just one example. The second panel there is the brazian fruit in Africa. Now, everybody may or may not know, you might not even want to think about it, why is fruit sweet? Fruit is sweet because they make sugar, and it's sweet because animals will want to eat them and then spread their seeds. So the brazian uh, plant actually, instead of making sugar, which takes an enormous amount of energy from each plant, they make one little knotten that binds to our taste buds a thousand times stronger than sugar and tricks the mouths of animals into believing that they're eating sugar, and by that it gets its seeds spread. So that's just one example of how nature has made these drugs to protect themselves or to foster future generations of the same plant or animal. Well, it turns out that these were first described about 23 years ago. And when we started the project, I looked into why had the pharmaceutical companies failed to make more progress when the first nons were described 23 years ago. And we came up with this list. I'm not going to go through a science lesson here. But one example is these fold poorly, poorly in E. coli and yeast. Well, yeast and bacteria are the workhorse of the biotech industry and the pharmaceutical industry if you're working on protein drugs. And if you can't make these things in those organisms, then I can understand why they wouldn't make a $100 million investment into trying to figure out a different solution. So we came up with this list of reasons that they had failed. And then with a gift from the grandmother of one of my patients, I was able to hire these two guys, Chris Malin and Colin Carrenti. Chris had been the head of molecular biology at Amgen here in town. Colin had been a student. And the day before I hired him, he defended his thesis, and he had figured out a way to trick human kidney cells into making these little knotted proteins for an entirely different reason. It was just by chance that I happened to go to his, his thesis defense. And he had already taken a job at another biotech company out in Woodenville. And I asked him, well, what are you going to be doing out there? And he said, I'll be doing crystallography to help them discover this new drug. And I said, well, what do you want to do in 10 years? And he said, well, I'd like to be a CEO. And, and I said, well, how many times have you seen somebody's crystallography bitch turn into a CEO <laughs> in the next 10 years? And with that, I had him hooked, and he came over. And in, in the next six months, 
he and Chris resolved five of those six problems. And in the past couple years, we've made significant progress on the sixth one, and I'll show you some of that data today that nobody else has seen. Now, it's always interesting when this slide goes from Mac to PC. Uh, what that really says is that at the time that we started this project, there were about 300 notons identified by all the scientists in the world. And there were about 6,000 that were identified in the, in the databases as possibly being notons. And I recruited a guy from Oracle, a computational guy. He wrote a Python program that crawled through all the genomic databases in the world. And in a day and a half, he identified 206,000 additional drugs that are made by plants and animals that fall into this category. These are now blueprints for what we do. We went from being able to make about 12 candidates a year to now being able to make about 10,000 in three weeks. And we actually surpassed that recently, where we made 30,000 in six days. This is what these little knot and proteins look like. You can see that they're tied in a knot, and all the active groups, the charges and the, and the groups that make them interact with other proteins are on the surface. And this is what we do with them. This is a, a base protein, and you can see how we can computationally change it and turn it into different shapes and different charges, each of which could interact with the proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease, autism, cancer, and interfere with those processes. And this is really a way to address diseases that can't be addressed by the little tiny molecules that are like 20 times smaller than these that are made by Merck and Pfizer and the other drug companies. When we design these on the computer, we just put in the sequence of them, put it in the computer, the guys in the lab give them my credit card, and this guy shows up with a FedEx envelope that has 10,000 genes in it the following Tuesday. We take those genes and we put them into a modified HIV virus that can't cause HIV, but it can deliver genes, and it spits them into human embryonic kidney cells that we've immortalized, and those human embryonic kidney cells begin churning out drugs overnight while we're home sleeping. And in the morning, we come back, take it off the shaker, put it onto a machine that purifies them, and by the end of the day, we have these new drug candidates. We just ordered our first robot to make these. That robot will be able to make about 2,000 individual proteins a month. Right now, we're making about 10 a week, so you'll see the ramp up that we get by bringing robotics into this. Now again, in addition to making these things, we have a therapeutic team that focuses on these diseases that affect kids. We've identified one new target for glioblastoma, one of the most challenging kinds of brain cancer that on the top you see one glioblastoma cell that's dividing into two, and all the DNA is perfectly dividing, and pretty soon there will be two cells. But when we hit that target, the cell explodes instead. It's called mitotic catastrophe. And that's what we're working toward, is these new drugs that will actually make cancer cells explode and disintegrate, rather than turning into two daughter cells. And we're making really nice progress on this. One of the things that happened at a lot of conferences like this when I would give the talk is people would say, if you can deliver light to the cancer, why can't you just deliver the drugs to the cancer? And the reason is that the chlorotoxin that we use from the scorpion, in addition to going to the cancer, a lot of it also went to the liver and to the spleen. So if we put a toxin on it, we'd wipe those two organs out, and we didn't want to do that. A few years ago, we had a fundraiser over at Fred Hutch, and the Kathy Gertzen Foundation sponsored it. And they raised about $100,000 that night. And we said, we want to do something unique with this money to honor Kathy. And so we started creating the Kathy Gertzen Library of 100 of these molecules that we would share freely with any scientist in the world. And I said to the team, since we're making these anyways, let's put some fluorescent lights on them, put them into mice that have cancer, and see where some of these go. Do they go to interesting places? It turns out, purely by serendipity, the third molecule we made went to cancer but it didn't go to the liver and to the spleen. Our holy grail we saw in the, th in the third molecule that we made. And it turns out that this molecule, anybody have any ideas where it came from? The grasshopper. Uh, so the grasshopper is teaching us now, and we have, with our computational abilities, made thousands of variants of this molecule, and we're honing in on the ones that we think will be best able to deliver the drugs right to the cancer. We hired our first chemist last week. Uh, in fact, Two and a half years ago, when we started this project, we had two scientists working on it. Right now, we just hired a 32nd scientist, and I just interviewed the 33rd uh, this morning. One of the things that we wanted to do is just see where these things go. Uh, different plants and different animals have reasons to get drugs to different parts of our body, and instead of fighting against nature, we thought we would learn what nature is doing and then work with it. We made 28 proteins that came from scorpions and spiders, and we found three more that went into the brain, like chlorotoxin. 
These molecules can be used as a foundation for schizophrenia, for Alzheimer's disease, autism, any disease that affects the brain that would be difficult to treat with the small molecules. We found one of these molecules that accumulates in the fluid around the brain, and if you look closely at that little tail that's coming out from the black spot in the top panel in the center, those are actually the new nerve cells that are being formed in the brain, and so this drug is able to act with specifically the new nerve cells that are coming out of the nerve stem cells. So you can imagine for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease that this would be a really important advancement. Again, you guys are the first seeing these slides uh, in public. Uh, how many of you have had a joint that started bugging you in your knee or foot? Yeah, look at all the hands go up now. I ask you a science question, no hands. <laughs> so unexpectedly, of those molecules that we tested from the 28 scorpion and spider molecules, we found quite a few of them that go specifically to the cartilage in every disc that's in our backbone, in the places where our ribs join our breastbone, in all the joints of our hips, our shoulders, every single joint in the body. And look at how specifically and how high these go to those joints. So imagine that we could take uh, a pain relieving medicine like a steroid and just attach it to this and deliver it right to the place where people are having pain and skip those injections that work for four or five days and don't affect the other joints and you can't get another one for six months and skip the side effects that would come by just taking a steroid systemically and having to deal with all those side effects. Uh, and you can imagine that a pharmaceutical company doing a partnership with us for what would be a blockbuster drug for osteoarthritis could fuel a lot of the work that we do on pediatric brain cancers and other rare diseases at the same time. So this is very much aligned with our overall mission. Uh, this is uh, one of the buildings at the Fred Hodge Cancer Center. And uniquely, they gave us an additional 4,000 square feet. That whole top row of windows is our new production facility for these proteins. They recognize that we're doing something that nobody else in the world can do, and ultimately we want to build a world-class program where scientists from all over the world can come and spend three weeks or three months or three years, whatever it takes to do their work with us uh, collaboratively. We want to break down the silos between different institutions to make this happen. Uh, this is part of the team. It's grown a lot even since this picture was taken, but these are the folks that do the work, and I want to acknowledge them. And finally, I want to acknowledge the community uh, when we started this project, uh, in addition to the challenges that the pharmaceutical companies faced, our decision was to not spin this out into its independent biotech company, because if we did, we'd be responsible for investors for getting the maximum return on it. And that would almost surely mean selling that company to a pharmaceutical company, where the decisions about which drugs were made and which ones weren't made would be in the hands of one small committee. And we didn't know if we could trust them with something that we think can really change the world. So. We started Project Violet in honor of this little girl, Violet, who was a patient of mine and who asked us to take her brain at autopsy after she died and make research tools to share with the world. In her honor, we started Project Violet. It became the front porch of this whole new drug discovery program uh, that we're talking about. And through Project Violet, uh, we have raised over $8 million in the last two years. That allows us to hire these 33 scientists to buy robots and to just go full speed ahead while keeping these libraries available to do our own research, to partner with pharmaceutical companies, to partner with biotech companies, and to partner with academics who are working on rare diseases that can't be treated in other ways. Uh, and so I appreciate your time. I encourage you to follow us on Facebook for Project Violet. We have a big fundraiser coming up on the 10th of this month. It's going to be super fun. You're all invited. Thank you so much.